Welcome back. Uh, anybody not here during our first session a few weeks ago? Frank and Janet? Paul? All right. Um, so we'll just do a little review. This is the whole point of it. Hopefully you have a packet here. Does anybody else need one? These are three articles that we have released so far from Mark Edwards. Again, um, it would be better if Mark was up here leading the conversation over something he wrote. But uh, he and I have had a lot of conversation or an agreement on a lot of these things. He has some tweaks. I'll add my tweaks to it as well. Uh, but due to COVID and Mark being immunocompromised, he's not really comfortable being out in public in this way. And so he is opting to stay home, writing, we talk, he and I talk, he writes, and we go through it that way. Again, the whole point of this, what is an evangelical and am I one? That word evangelical uh, can mean something different depending on who is using it or how it is used, right? We use it in our name, Holy Trinity Evangelical Lutheran Church. We are part of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. And yet if you turn on the news, they will talk about evangelicals as could be a voting block or politics or a uh, particular demographic within Christianity. Correct? They do not all mean the same thing. And so what we have found is there are people who are having conversations that are trying to articulate what it means and aren't fully able to, either for themselves what it means, am I an evangelical, and if I am, what does that mean? If I go to an, e, if I'm a pastor within an ELCA church or I attend an ELCA church, uh, or if somebody says, oh, and I heard this about the evangelicals in the news, that means you, right? Uh, how do I describe the difference between the two? And so we want to have conversations, respectful conversations, and I think that's something we're really clear on also. It would be really easy for these, this to devolve into. And so this is, we want to keep this at a theological level. Does that make sense? Um, what are those beliefs about God that might lead into things? We don't want this to devolve into because this is true about many people and not all. So this is what's hard about it as well. As I take a step back before I get into too deep at one point evangelicals in the way that is used in the news and not for us is a very general term and might refer, some might say yes, and some might say no, or I subscribe to part of those beliefs, but not all of those beliefs, or I'm an evangelical, but I distance myself from them, right? So even when we talk about evangelicals in that way, at some level, we are generalizing. Uh, and so we want to be mindful of that. And like I said, we want to keep it on a theological level, not on a political level. We don't want it to devolve into because um, oftentimes evangelicals as a voting block are generally uh, frequently most likely to be, again, not always. So we want to be very mindful of that. Uh, Pro-gun, anti-abortion, anti-LGBTQ, right? Uh, and very vocal about these things. And so we don't want to devolve into these issues and start arguing about Second Amendment rights. That's not the purpose of this. The purpose of it is to talk about theologically how does being an evangelical Lutheran differ from how theologically those uh, that might claim to be evangelicals differ. Does that make sense? Ken, go for it. So, are we the only congregation that is having this discussion now, or is this common throughout ELCA churches and specifically throughout the United States? Yeah, great question. So, if you didn't hear, and so for people at home, Ken is wondering uh, is this a common conversation that is going on in other churches as well? Uh, whether it's the ELCA at large, the New England Synod, it is not. This is something that, uh, that I thought would be really beneficial for us to do. And I've had a lot of conversations uh, with Mark about it. Um, just got done reading a book titled Jesus and John Wayne, How White Evangelicals Divided and Corrupted a Nation. And as I read, and it was written by a woman, I, um, 
Calvin College in Grand Rapids, Michigan, a pretty strong evangelical uh, Christian university. Uh, and as she was writing about, here's what describes, commonly referred to as evangelical, I thought, man, that is not who I am. And yet we have that word in there. And I know that it's such a common thing. And one of the things that turns people off from Christianity is if that's what it is, no thank you. And so how are we better able to articulate who we are? And sometimes that occurs when we are better able to understand what we're not. Does that make sense? And again, not trying to degrade, to demonize, anything like that. We're talking about differences. One thing that I always try and be mindful of, and I'm sure I don't do a very good job of, is I might be wrong. (laughs) So we want to have that sense of humility as we go into it. We are striving the best we can to have an understanding of who, what it means to be called a follower of Jesus, And what does that look like for our life? And how do we come to the beliefs that we have? Long answer for that, Ken. Sorry. Glenn. So if you didn't hear, and for those at home, Glenn had said he's uh, glad our sign just says Holy Trinity, not Holy Trinity Evangelical, because it means different things. And unless you really know the difference, you make an assumption about what that word means. Um, so there's a lot of talk. I mean, I've talked. Should we still be using that word? Do we try and reclaim that word? Um, I just let's educate us on it, right? So let's educate us on it so we know what it means. So what we did over the first time together, Mark had written two articles, one and two, which kind of introduced the idea of what that word evangelical means. Real short, it means Greek for good news. It, Greek for good news. And then we come to an understanding of what that good news is through Scripture. And we started to have a conversation in how we read Scripture. And, then, and that's so if you have your packet, that's Article 1. Right? Then, if you flip to Article 2, Mark then highlights uh, four characteristics that undergird an evangelical theology. Okay? Undergird an evangelical theology that help to give a basis for an evangelical understanding of how we understand who God is. And those four are how you understand Bible or Biblicism. We're going to go into more in depth with that today. How we understand the cross, focus on Christ's redeeming work of the cross. That'll be the next one coming out. That's what I talked about. Oftentimes is referred to as atonement theory. What did Jesus really do on the cross? And there's different ways of understanding that. And what does sacrifice mean? And how does forgiveness play into it? Conversion or conversionism, emphasis on the new birth. Among mainline denominations, which is what we would consider ourselves part of. So this is almost a whole other lesson there. If you have Christianity, right, uh, you could, before you get down into the specifics of the ELCA, you can get into broader categories. Does that make sense? A broader category would be Catholicism, Catholic A broader category would be evangelicalism, which would, and then a broader uh, category would be mainline denomination, mainline Protestantism, right? Evangelicalism would be more along Southern Baptist, uh, Pentecostalism, uh, some of those non denominational churches frequently would, would unofficially, right, group themselves under evangelicalism. Mainline denominations are more like ELCA Lutherans, Methodists, Episcopal Church, um, Presbyterian, although Presbyterian, just like ELCA, there's different types of uh, Lutheran churches. There's different Presbyterian churches as well. You have PCA, PCUSA, (laughs) you know. So there's a lot of different ones. Depending on the Presbyterian church, you might go into an evangelical strand or mainline Protestant strand. Um, 
So, but how you view baptism, to come back to that third point, evangelical theology has a view of one way in which baptism works, and we and many mainline denominations and Catholicism have a different view on what baptism is or what that new birth is. So that's a hallmark of evangelical theology. Glenn? I've always had a hard time understanding it. So Glenn asks, I repeat the questions for everybody else and for people on The View. Uh, Glenn asks, where do Anabaptists fall into that? I've always struggled with what Anabaptist is because it's not really a denomination that's out there so much. It's uh, another line of thinking. So Lynn, can you speak to that at all, Anabaptist line of thinking? If you would, could, would you? Got it. Perfect. Thank you. Anabaptist was the question. Lynn is saying it's under the evangelical part, being baptized again. Mennonite fits into that. Okay, Church of the Brethren. And remember, these it's, they're kind of fluid categories. So it's, under, it's not to say, oh, you're evangelical, you believe A, B, C, D. That's, it doesn't quite work that way. So we're just trying to have a broader understanding of how it could, can, is used at times. Okay? The fourth way is activism, a sharing of the faith. Uh, last week it came up about kingdom building. And what does it mean to be kingdom building? And what does it mean to bring God's kingdom here on earth? And a lot of that has to do with what does it mean for America and an American, uh, a Christian America. Because a lot of times in evangelical theology, that is how it is lived through. Um, what it means for America to be a city shining on a hill. And so uh, we'll get into some of that as well. Other thoughts, questions so far? We're going to tackle number three now at this point. That's just a little overview to catch everybody up on where we are. Lynn. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if you didn't hear Lynn, and for people, you know, these are good, really good four categories to talk about that we believe in also, right? So it's not just evangelicals believe in this, but what do we believe about the Bible, I think you could say, right? We believe by the Bible is God's Word. But what does that mean? So we're going to talk about that. Um, uh, yeah, so good things to just have a deeper understanding and appreciation of is really where we hope this will go. Glenn. Yeah, so in 70, and that's right, so within the ELCA, uh, I'm going to expand on what Glenn said as opposed to just repeating it, um, right? There are three main Lutheran denominations, but there are many more. You have Wisconsin Synod uh, Lutheran Church, you have the Missouri Synod Lutheran Church, you have the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. Wisconsin Synod, Missouri Synod, they might have a tendency to fall under more a evangelical theology. I don't know if they consider themselves evangelical or not, but there are differences within it. And you're saying, if I heard right, in the 70s was an area in which that came up more. And to go to Lynn's point, those social issues can really be divisive. Uh, and that's what happened in 2009. If you remember, the ELC at that point said, you know what, we are... The, the whole idea about how do we, what do we believe on same-sex relationships 
uh, issues of the LGBTQ community in 2009, the ELCA essentially said, we understand and honor that people that have differences of opinion are both doing their best to be faithful. And rather than saying, this is what the church at large, we're going to trust congregations to make these decisions for that. And uh, what ended up happening in 2009 is there were some churches that said, I can't even be part of a church body that would allow other churches to call and ordain uh, someone who is in a same-sex committed relationship. Therefore, they removed themselves from it, and one of those denominations that started was the NALC, the North American Lutheran Church. But there were other ones as well. So you can see how confusing it all can be. Even within Lutheranism, we have many different ones. We're just trying to educate. Lynn. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And maybe that's, Lynn, thank you again. Lynn wasn't a plant, but this is a good segue into our topic for today. Because how do we support our view on the role of women in the church? And how we support our view of role of women in the church, those social issues, can a lot of times come down to how do we view Scripture? How do we read Scripture? What does Scripture allow what does Scripture not allow? Is it, see, this is what the Bible says, therefore that's the rule for all space and time from here to eternity? Or is it, yes, that's what the Bible says, but that doesn't apply to us today? So how do we read Scripture? Hallmark number one we're going to talk about. Ken. Yeah. So I can't. I I don't want to to go too much into that topic because, uh, and for people that are watching at home or wherever they might be, another issue that can be divisive between evangelicals or Catholicism or mainline Protestantism is the role of Israel and what did it mean for Israel was in 1945 or afterwards 47 to be welcomed back and be given land. Um, back into the home, and what does that, is that inaugurating something, right? Again, does it go back to how we read Scripture, I think, that this is what's going to happen, and this is a sign that's going to happen, and this is, right? So how do we make this happen? Again, establishing God's kingdom on earth. Um, and so I don't, I don't know the official stance of what the ELCA has on that, and I don't want to get into it. Um, but instead, I, let's get into this whole idea of how we read Scripture that we touched on before, and have an opportunity to give more attention to today. Sound good? All right. So in Mark's article, article number three, a hallmark of Lutheran theology is sola scriptura. Scripture alone. Right? This is how we understand the good news of Jesus Christ. The evangelical, right? That's what evangelical means. Eugelion is the Greek for good news. But, as you can see midway through that first, uh, that second paragraph, the rub was that folks soon found out they couldn't agree on what Scripture alone taught about Christian belief and practice. Unbelievable. Christians don't agree. 
we all live in our own different universes. Yeah, I, I like what George had said. How do we validate? How do we understand another position? Um, not worry about right or wrong so much. I think we want to be we want to be right. So if I'm right, somebody else has to be wrong. Let's understand, and then we can move forward from there. What I like about what Mark is doing, right? So you have that third paragraph. Not going to read through all of it. Um, but he talks about a lot of it came to proof texting. See this, I'm going to pull this scripture out. This is what it means. So whenever you hear that term proof texting, it means I want to find a text, a verse that proves my point. So I can say the Bible says it, I believe it, that ends it, right? Proof texting. We all do it. Protestant, mainline denominations, Protestantism, we do it as well. Let's lift up the verses we like. Let's ignore the verses we don't like. You heard me talk almost in a way about that this morning. Sell all your possessions and give your money to the poor. I wanted to try and justify that. Is that really what Jesus meant? Let's think he means something else. I, so it's like, how do we hold that intention? Did Jesus mean that? Did not Jesus mean that? What does that mean? How do we live that out? But I do want to talk about uh, one, two, three, the fourth paragraph there and start our conversation there. With the rise of science in the 18th and 19th century, it became common to argue that since God was the creator of the world, including all of nature and human beings, and since God was also the author of Scripture, therefore nature and Scripture must agree with and reinforce each other. It was further assumed that morality could also be derived both from the book of Scripture and from the book of nature. So as science develops, what it starts to occur? There's discrepancies, aren't there? Is the world created in seven days? Is it not created in seven days? Wow, we're learning that maybe the earth is millions of years old. What is also important to point out it was not just fully assumed that the world was seven days up until this point. This is when it really became an issue. There are writings, I think it was Augustine back in the third century, that says, you know, these are allegories. These are stories to convey a deeper truth. Not Christians throughout the beginning of time. It's not like all of a sudden it's seven days, seven days, seven days, seven days. Now science enters the picture. Oh, maybe it's not. And now the argument occurs. Does that make sense? is I really think there was a more open understanding to what Scripture was, and then science and a deeper understanding comes in, and now people feel threatened. And now there's a, a more obvious conflict that occurs because maybe it's a bit more obvious that things are allegorical as opposed to good catch, Glenn. Things are a bit more allegorical than they are literal in that way. Does that make sense? George? Yeah, I, I, I really liked what you had said at the beginning about a religion and science. Um, I, I, how they work together, but you had used a, a, another, they have to evolve together and understanding together. I forget what that was, but um, not one to prove the other wrong. How do they work in conjunction with each other? One actually deepens the understanding of the other. And too often, um, one is, it's like they're put up uh, against each other. If you watch in the news, uh, does anyone know who the uh, 
National Institute of Health is, who just resigned or is stepping down. Does anyone see this in the news? Anyone know his name? Francis Collins is his name, uh, who's been a leading voice in uh, a lot of the COVID stuff that's been going on. He is also a very strong evangelical Christian that has openly embraced evolution and wrote a great book. I don't have it here in front of me, The Language of God. And he talks about science has deepened his understanding uh, and has no issue saying the earth is 4 billion years old and what science is showing uh, us about it. Um, so, um, thoughts, questions so far? All right. Yeah, Lynn. Right. And so what are we expecting Scripture to do for us? I think that has a lot to do with it. Um, scripture is not, yes, it is the Word of God. I want to see, I believe I just read this in here earlier. I'm going to jump ahead to it. If you go to the second page, Scripture and the Word of God distinguished and the authority of Scripture for Luther. We talked about this a little bit last time. What are we expecting Scripture to do? Oh, this is what it was. Uh, history is different from back then to the way it is now and how it's recorded and how it is disseminated. The Bible was not written as if it was uh, news for you to pick up the paper and this is what occurred the day before. We need to understand that. That was not the purpose of writing Scripture. The purpose of writing Scripture was to convey who God is, who we are, and how we struggle with understanding that relationship between the two. So things are written down to help interpret the events that are going on, not so much to solely record the events that are going on. Does that make sense? They are two different things, recording and interpreting. When we interpret we have some leeway in there. We can add things. We can uh, exaggerate some things. You know, we can make an emphasis on certain things. That doesn't mean it's not true. So we need to also distinguish between factual and true, okay? But the whole thing is, what does it point to? And that's what I like uh, what Luther talks about all right, well, Mark talks about the authority of Scripture for Luther came from the gospel message it contained and conveyed right below. God and Scripture of God are two different things. At one, um, at one point, Luther distinguished between the cloths that swaddled the infant Jesus and Jesus himself. The cloths, cloths in which the infant Jesus was wrapped are nothing but holy Scripture in which Christian faith lies wrapped up. I talked about that before. We talk about Bible or Scripture being the manger that holds the Christ child. We don't worship Scripture. Does that make sense? We worship what Scripture points to, which leaves us able to critique Scripture. So when it is Scripture alone, it's Christ alone, faith alone, what points us to Christ? And that is what we think is um, points us more to the Word of God. It allows us to say not all Scripture is equal. And we're okay with saying that as Lutherans, right? Some of those laws in Leviticus, are they as important as blessed are the merciful, blessed are the poor, blessed are those who hunger and thirst, you see what I'm saying? I think uh, we'd understand. It's easy to say, don't eat, don't wear clothes of the same thread. or two different threads. Is not on the same level as blessed are those who hunger and thirst. They're not the same. By understanding there's a difference between word of God and scripture of God, it gives us that ability to say that. Does that make sense? 
thoughts, questions there at that point, I think that's a really important thing to understand about how we read Scripture. What points us to Christ is um, extremely important on when we read. Is it pointing us to Christ? Thoughts, questions, anything like that so far? Glenn. Yeah. Okay. It also leads us to faith to talk about how faith comes into being from other sources other than a written word. Mm-hmm. Uh, in the course of relationship between nature and science, you know, that it, it, uh, it also digs into the, for me anyway, the mystery of faith to which is much broader than human understanding could possibly mm-hmm. Right, and so it opens us up. It means that we don't have to worry about using words. So if you go in a lot of churches that um, might be just a minute, Franklin, I'll get to you. That Sorry if I've... Ex- oh. Um, one of the things that you might see on a lot of church websites that would consider themselves evangelical, if you go to like an about what we believe about Scripture, a lot of times you might see the infallible or the inerrable, inerrant word of God. Right? Because we have to hold true to this. The Scripture is the same as God actually saying these words. Right, If they are the same thing, it better be inerrable because God is inerrant. It better be infallible because God is perfect. So you have to hold on to that, which means it goes back to that, like, you know, the Bible says it was created in seven, the world was created in seven days, so it better have been created in seven days. And if not, then we better find ways in which if Scripture says something else, how do we rectify or how do we justify that? How do we explain it away? Lynn? You in seminary, Lynn is saying he had to sign his name to scripture as inerrant and infallible. <laughs> did you lie? Lynn asked, did you lie? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and it's so. This is a great question to ask. If we don't, what is hard, or what is scary, or what? If you don't subscribe to, or why might people who do subscribe to an errant or infallible, why might they say, "This is what it has to be," or what if you were to say, "No, it's not." What? Why is that hard to move from one place to the other? What is it about the Scripture being inerrant and infallible that we want to cling to at times? Can someone, uh, what might either from your own perspective or speculate? Kurt. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. And I think that's what's much or she, <laughs> how God made it. Right. Which is that's a, that's a whole other thing we have to be mindful of. Uh, again, when in Scripture. When we use the word he. What does that internally do to us? Right. Because that's what is in the Bible. That's what those writers used. And the and it is inerrant, infallible. So if they're using the word he and God is using them in their hand and just moving it along, then God must be a he. Which means then women, eh, 
you're a little bit lower than us. Does that make sense? Right? So we have to be very mindful. So hold on a minute, George, real quick, because I can finish up on, on Kurt's point. So I really do think there is a large strain for the history of Christianity that saw these stories as not what happened, but what does it say about who God is? God created it. We live in a time, we live in a culture where that is not always the prevailing attitude. Does that make sense? Even though we might think it is. The evangelical movement, as we see it, really, as we said, has a recent beginning going back into the late 1800s and has moved forward since then. But it is not a, I would not say the evangelical movement is, you know what, a long historic movement. Not that there weren't trends of it, but as we know it today, it's very recent. George? Yeah. So just different understandings, that role of women and, and how that plays itself out when we understand whether you have to wear hats, whether you can't wear hats, where you sit, all of those kind of things, right? We can say, well, here it says in Scripture, this is what it says. But... <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, right? I, and maybe that's, I don't want to get into it, but here's an example where it plays itself out into those social issues. Uh, if I, and I, if I'm speaking incorrectly, I apologize. Second Amendment rights, the right to bear arms. Does that change over time? What does it mean to bear arms? Why did they write that into the Constitution at the time? Is that still the same reasons why we might need that today? I'm not saying what's right and what's wrong, but I think that's a great example of you can see we're going to argue over that. What does that mean for us? Okay, Franklin and then Ken, and then there's another point I want to make that Mark brings up that's a hallmark of Lutheran theology. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Right on, Franklin. Right? It's a slippery, it can be a slippery slope for some people. And once you start down that slope, where does it stop? You mean you tell me Adam and Eve aren't real people? So then is this not real? Is this not real? Well, how do you know that Jesus even lived? Where is that line? And if I don't know where that line is, it can be a very scary place to be. So uh, I know those are some things that I went through uh, at seminary, continually go through. I mean, one of the things they say at seminary is they tear you down just to kind of build you back up. You have to deconstruct what you have been taught in order to reconstruct something else. And I think that's going on, what's happening a lot in the world today People are deconstructing and then realizing, I have no desire to put something back together. I think that is really what's happening. Deconstructing is really popular, especially in the evangelical world. There's podcast after podcast after podcast of people. One I listen to periodically is called The Deconstructionists. <laughs> um, and 
they deconstruct it, and then it's like, ah, I don't want to put it back together. I'm going to move on. Uh, Ken, did you want to say something? Right. And I th- go ahead. Yeah. So Ken and reiterated for those that are um, uh, not able to hear it because of the microphone that Ken was exactly where Franklin was before um, 10 years ago. It had to be this, this and this, because if you start down that slope, where does it end? Uh, and it's a very scary place to be. And Ken has Ken has gone through that. Um, and so I want to get to another thing before we run out of time, a real hallmark of Lutheran theology that Mark talks about when we talk about, okay, so what's, Im- what's important then? <laughs> how do we say if this isn't true, this isn't, how do we know what's important? What are those things? There's a lot of different things, uh, different ways of looking at it. One thing from Lutheran, if you want to look on that last, uh, I want to make sure I get to the rest, last page, is law and gospel, the last paragraph. Maybe even comes up before. Um, law and gospel is just a comment or just a, a good way of understanding. When we read scripture, a lot of times, think of them as two categories. Does it fit under law? Or does it fit under gospel? Law is what is demanded of you. Mark talks about it on the end of the bottom page. It's commanded. You have to do this. If you don't, ooh, right? Law. The other side of it is gospel. Gospel says you're not going to, and you're loved. Take a deep breath. Law is what reveals us. It's a mirror. You can't hide from it. It's it's the best way I can put it that I've come to understand, and I, a professor in seminary, uh, that used this analogy that she talked about. She had a, a friend that went away to a, a, I hate, a camp to help her lose weight. I'll say that. And one of the things they had you do at the beginning is look at yourself in a mirror without clothes on. How many people are excited about that? Because you can't hide, right? You can't hide. Law exposes you. It reveals who you really are. Does that make sense? You can also call it the hammer. It shatters or destroys the image that you think you've built. That's the law. Sell all your possessions and give your money to the poor. How many people have actually done that? That's law. Does that make sense? It reveals me for who I am. And it says, I'm not that perfect. And not even that perfect, I'm not perfect at all. It reveals me. It drives me to Christ. It says, it it pushes you to Christ. I can't do it. And it says, Christ, that's the gospel then. You can't, you're right. Christ does it for you. Christ does it. You can't. And this is going to come into, again, it's amazing how all of these things play together. When we talk about God's kingdom and what that means, right? And when we talk about baptism, this is a big thing to me 
on why we, uh, why we do infant baptism. We'll talk about that in a few weeks. Why we don't wait for someone to accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. But why we do infant baptism. Because we read Scripture as law and gospel. Law says you have to do this, but we failed. It drives you to Christ. Gospel, and God loves you anyways. <laughs> and you're accepted anyways. And you're forgiven anyways. Does that make sense? Law, gospel, it's how we read it. It's another sign why we don't consider all Scripture equal. It helps us understand. Thoughts, questions so far about all of these things that we've talked about? Glenn? Yeah. So the, Glenn's question was, we can't be perfect, so why even try? Right? Just because you can't doesn't get you out of the fact that you shouldn't try. <laughs> it doesn't. It doesn't mean it doesn't get you out of. It's not that you have to. And this is, I mean, that's right. That's a great point. And it's for us, again, it goes to baptism. It goes to look at the way we view the cross. You don't have to do anything. Great, I don't. I'm going to go on with my merry way. God's going to save me. God's going to forgive me. So what does it matter? You're right. I, I, some aspect, I think there's truth to that. That's what I struggle with. And... How does that compel us to do something? Not that we have to, that we want to. Not that we have to, we get to. Because we are so enraptured in the image and the view of God's new kingdom in heaven on earth, we can't help but participate. I don't have to give my money. But because I see what's going on in the world, I can't help but give it. Because I'm so disturbed by what is happening, and I'm so caught up in God's vision, I can't just sit idly by and let things occur. Do you see the difference in there? You don't have to. So the question becomes, what are you going to do? <laughs> it really is. I mean, it's how do we hold that intention? But if we have to pick one, grace wins. <laughs> Yeah, I'm so George is talking about an us versus them. And Christ always identifies with the them. <laughs> you know, always identifies with them. And we put Christ there. <laughs> we said we don't want you to be one of us because you you demand too much, Jesus. <laughs> so let us stay in our own ways. But Christ says, does it anyways? Right? Despite everyone abandoning him, Christ still does it. And that's going to get to what happens on the cross. So you're jumping ahead of us a little bit. But I think that's... Uh, go ahead, George. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So you're getting more into the cross. Uh, George is expanding on that us versus them. I want to hold off on that because that's going to be our next one. What, what does the cross do? And that's kind of atonement theory um, is the technical or theological term 
for it, cross. Uh, but I, I feel this has been a good basis for how we read Scripture, how Lutherans read. And yes, we say how Lutherans read Scripture. I, as Lutherans, we believe this is how Christians should read Scripture. <laughs> this is how Christians should read Scripture. Also understanding not all Christians read Scripture this way. We can get a whole, uh, I love this one, actually. I found it very helpful. The Methodists, if you know uh, John Wesley, uh, there's something called the Wesleyan Quadrilateral. Anyone grow up Methodist and learn the Wesleyan Quadrilateral? So that's another way to looking at of reading Scripture. Quadrilateral, right? The root word in there is for. So when you're reading Scripture, you look at tradition, experience, reason, and, oh, shoot, what's the fourth quad in there? I don't know if it's context. Maybe that it, <laughs> you should be, right, Bob? <laughs> Bob said it's context. But if you look up Wesleyan Quadrilateral, there's four things. Tradition, reason, experience. Oh, I'm blinking on what that fourth one. It might be, maybe it's context. Um, on how does that help us interpret what Scripture means? It, it's another way of looking. It doesn't just say, see what it says. Oh, let's learn these other ways about it. I found the Wesleyan to think about those categories as I'm reading Scripture to help me understand it also. And it's a lot. It, I feel it's a harder way of reading Scripture, isn't it? Oh. it could. Hopefully it makes it fun, and it makes it exhausting. Just tell me what I need to know. Right? I mean, you can see the an appeal in that. Um, scripture. scripture. All right, so when reading it, it's Scripture, reason, tradition, experience. Right? Oh, when understanding, so I think this is a, not just reading, but how do we understand an issue going on in the world today? Right? Or how do we understand what does scripture, scripture say, tradition say, reason say, experience say? All of those things. And that helps us come to a, an understanding of what we believe. I find that really helpful. Yeah. Nothing in the Bible is contemporary. You know, it was written hundreds of years after <laughs> the Old Testament, hundreds of years after whatever. And the gospel, the first gospel was what, fifty years or so after Jesus. I I would say go ahead, just go ahead, Dave. Sorry. So none of it <laughs> Right, it's not history. Dave is saying all of Scripture written, was written after the fact, right? Um, I don't know exactly when the Psalms were all written down. I would say the closest thing to it would be letters of Paul. That is more contemporary, but again, that isn't so much history. That's understanding uh, real. Here's what's going on in our community. What is that... What do you have to say to us? So let me exhort you. Let me encourage you. Let me chastise you. Let me lift you up. Right? So that's what Paul is doing there more than trying to recount history. When it comes to history, I think frequently, like Genesis is not the oldest book in the Bible. Genesis was probably accumulated. To put, those were stories that circulated, but it probably was written down somewhere time during the Exodus. You know, the 500s or so B.C. Uh, it's not... Not the oldest. A lot of scholars think maybe the Exodus, the, being kicked out of the Garden of Eden, is more about understanding the Israelites being kicked out of the Promised Land. That it's reflecting that and helping to understand that aspect of it. That's when it was, it was uh, written down. Franklin? What happened, right? It's understanding events. How did we get here? <laughs> so much of the Bible is understanding how, to, especially the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, how did we get here? So, thoughts, questions? We're at 1130. I want to be mindful of people's times. Dot. Yeah. Right. It was always to read the Bible devotionally in the history of the world is a very recent concept. 
because over the history of the world, the vast majority of people couldn't read. It had to be read to them. And someone had to talk about it. Which then, right, talk about abuse of power. Imagine if you guys couldn't read and I'm telling you what it means. <laughs> you could see the danger in that as well. So we have to be mindful of that. Right? So how do we read it together? We all bring different experience to it. Anything else? Thank you, Dot. Uh, Dot, it said we have to read it in community. And so that's expounding on that point, not just individually. Thank you. All right. On that note, thank you for coming. I, how about we end in a word of prayer? Sound good? The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for our conversations, our understanding of your word and what it means for us. How when we come to Scripture, we understand what we are reading. So open our eyes and our ears to new ways, to new understandings, to know that my experience does not make the rule, but other people have points that are valid and that we can learn from. Be with us now as we go through our day. Let your presence always be close and never far. far. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you, everybody. If you don't mind grabbing your chair, that would be greatly appreciated. And enjoy it. <laughs>